welcome friends to this monthly meeting we are having uh, in the Chicago land area. The idea of having these monthly meetings is that on the spiritual path, the mind takes control over us and does not stay with us when we want to follow this path. It's a constant reminder we need for ourselves. Very often, the effect of a meeting does not last more than a few days, sometimes a few hours. Sometimes we hear this very nice talk and very impressive and we are going to meditate regularly now from today onwards and next day we have forgotten. So that is why it is good to have these regular meetings as a reminder that let us not stray away from something which is so important for us. This life of ours is so short compared to the cosmic time in which we are living, compared to billions of years which they say this world is existing and will exist. To stay here for a hundred years or so or even less sometimes is not much time. And the way we look back upon our lives, we find that time flies very quickly. And therefore we sometimes find we regret we could have done so many things which we missed out because we thought there was plenty of time. There isn't plenty of time. Time is very limited in this physical body. It is quite possible that we have an immortal soul which is beyond this time and space, which has never been born and never dies. If we are aware of that and are conscious of our soul, and are able to experience who we are as a soul, we don't have to bother about time at all. But if we are not conscious of it, and we are conscious only of this physical body as ourself, then time is of the essence. Time is very important then. And we must not waste any time at all. After all, when you take care of this body, you are taking care of it only for a very short time. The body Everybody leaves it. We have watched people. People who claim to be immortal have died. People who were great masters have died. People who said that they have discovered the elixir of everlasting life over here in the physical body have all gone. We see them going. We don't seem to think that we are also going away like that. And we may go very suddenly and find there was no time left at all to do anything. And what is the big importance of being so, so, so making it so important to be so, doing something in this physical body, in a physical life? The importance is that in order to escape from the cycle of birth and death, cycle of the world of duality, world of pain and pleasure, in order to get out of it, the only window of opportunity we have is the physical body. So that is why it's very important that we make full use of the time we have in this physical body and not waste it at all. Once we are out of this body, we have no control over anything. It's all predetermined. It is also predetermined here, but we don't see it like that. We don't experience it like that. We experience free will here. We experience the opportunity to make choices. And when we have the opportunity to make choices, we choose what is good for us. And that is why we choose the spiritual path and say this is going to be a guarantee and insurance for our well-being after we leave this body. If we don't do it while we are in the physical body, it will be too late. And we will be going round and round in circles of birth and rebirth. So that's why you can have many forms of life. The soul is a unit of consciousness. It can embed itself in any form. It is actually now, right now, in the form of plants, in the form of insects, animals, fish, fowl. They all have the same soul, the same soul we have. The soul is no different. It's only a unit of consciousness. And therefore, Whenever something becomes alive, a form becomes alive, it has a soul. Soul is the life force that creates metabolic action in form 
and allows it to grow, allows it to be born, grow and die. It follows this law of beginning, middle and end. All forms follow that law, no matter what form it is. There are forms which we cannot see with our eyes, such as angels, such as ghosts, such as disembodied spirits of people who have died and are still roaming around here because of their attachments. There are many forms. Those forms also die. They also have a birth. Every form that has ever been created has a lifespan. Even the mind which thinks and which we very often confuse to be the soul, even the thinking mind itself has a lifespan and it is born and dies. It may have a very long lifespan, still at a lifespan. And just like in the physical body, at the end of the day when we are about to die, we say, oh, I could have done so much better. We say the same thing when our internal, internal spine body, sensory system, the sensory body, when that dies, we say the same thing. We could have made much better use of our sense perceptions. When the mind dies, we say the same thing. I would have used this mind as my, as my tool for so much activity. I spent it all in devising programs and plans outside in an illusory world that was being created by the mind. I could have done much better. All these thoughts come to us when any part of us is about to die. Therefore, when we have these meetings, and now given the dates of these meetings in advance, so some people like to come from little distance, they can make their arrangements in, in advance. They know the dates when we meet every month. The idea of meeting here is, let us remind ourselves, this is a great opportunity to have this window open to us, to get out of this mess, which we call a physical world, because it is a world of duality, of pain and pleasure, of pairs of opposites. And the only way we can do it is to seek, which is an option given to us because of free will. So long as we feel we can make a choice, we can seek. And it is the seeking that leads to our liberation from this big trap of birth and rebirth that we go through. People say, am I saying these things based on any philosophy? Is it an intellectual concept that somebody has created and we are following? Is it religion? Is it a set of dogmas somebody laid down or a scripture that was produced and we are following it? Not at all. I am not suggesting any of these things. I am suggesting that the only definite proof we have of something is that we exist. Everything else can be just made up by our perceptions. The fact that we are the experiencer, our perception is the only reality. And we start from there. What can we perceive? What can we find out? What lies in our sense perceptions outside? And what can we find out about our soul and consciousness and mind inside? These opportunities are available to us now. You can belong to any religion, have any faith or no faith, be a God-fearing person or an atheist. This particular way of examining what the truth is, is open to all. It is not based on any dogma whatsoever. And if you have any idea that there is a dogma involved in exploring your own self, throw it away. To explore yourself, you just go within yourself. The self is the only reality we know for certain. We all know we exist and that is our self. Of course, once we start from there, it becomes very easy to say, if, if I am the self, where do I exist? If this is a world being created and I am experiencing it through my perceptions, where am I doing it from? When you put this question to yourself, it does not take very long to find out that so long as you are in a physical body, you are operating from within the physical body. The unit of consciousness is not operating from outside anywhere. It's operating from within the body. Because the body seems to be enveloping, covering it, enclosing it. 
and if we are enclosed by the physical body, then where are we if we were just a unit of consciousness and not the body? A little introspection tells us that we don't operate from our hands or our feet or our legs, even torso or even the heart. In the wakeful state, we are operating from our heads. We open our eyes and look at the world and we feel we are right behind the eyes from where we look. Everything else in consciousness appears to be below us. We don't feel that we are sitting in the heart and above us are the eyes and the head. Nobody feels that. This heart is just an organ for supplying blood and sustaining our life here, but is not the seat of consciousness. The seat of wakeful consciousness is behind the eyes and we can feel with eyes closed that we have a body which is below where we are if we are a unit of consciousness with no dimension. Therefore, if we know that much, that our self exists within this body, in the head, behind the eyes, very good starting point to examine who are we? What is our self? Go right there. Go right to the place where the self is sitting right now. The self is sitting behind the eyes and in the head and all we have to do is to go there. Now, how do we go somewhere? How do we travel, supposing we have to travel in consciousness, but not with the body? And we want to travel, say, to downtown Chicago from here. We can imagine what downtown Chicago is like, and we can feel we are there, we can see the street, we can remember, recall those things. And for a moment we are there. What have we done? How did we go there? By putting our attention on this thought that we are there. We imagined we were there. This is a wonderful gift we have got of imagination. And putting our attention along with imagination where we like. If we can move our attention through imagination wherever we like, can we do the same thing to imagining that we are behind the eyes in the center and put our attention there? If we can do that, you will find out who the self is. Let's not make too much mystery about these things because the spiritual path is to discover the spirit, discover the soul, to discover who you are as a conscious entity. And if we know that the conscious entity lies behind the eyes in the head and we can use imagination and attention to go there, we found the way. So therefore, if we can do that, we get an answer to who we are. We will also discover how the body is creating an experience for us in the material world that even when we are no body, there is something else covering us which creates another experience of a different kind that even if that cover is taken off and we only have the mind and soul together, the thinking mind and the intuitive soul, the soul that provides consciousness and power of life and the mind that thinks and rationalizes. If we are only left with these two, we still know that the mind is covering us around and we are in the center of them. We are always in the center. We are the center of every cover that we can create and we are also in the center if there is no cover. Center is the truth. That's where the self is. So starting from a very simple point behind the eyes within the physical body, we can have a discovery of all these things. The difficulty is, and that is important, the difficulty is we have never tried to withdraw our attention within ourselves behind the eyes. We were never taught that. We were taught how to focus attention on things. And that is why we try to focus attention even when we want to focus attention inside the eyes. We are focusing attention away from where we are focusing attention, where we are. People meditate and they even want to follow the third eye meditation. That means meditate behind the eyes. They close their eyes and imagine there's a space there and they see their little self sitting in the head and look at that and say, that's me sitting. That's not you at all. You are the one looking at that. You are the one behind that. A very common mistake. We spend years on this kind of activity thinking we're doing meditation on the self. The self is the one that looks at the image that we create. Therefore, looking at something 
which is focusing attention on something away from yourself does not work. It does not withdraw your attention to yourself. To withdraw your attention to yourself, you must use imagination that you are actually sitting there and not seeing anything. Can you see your own eyes in the physical body? Nobody can. We can see a reflection in a mirror. We see with the eyes and yet we can't see our own eyes. Same thing is true in sight. You can't see your eyes. You can't see your face. You can see, you can feel you are there like you feel you are here. You feel your eyes are working. Same thing is inside. That's a very common mistake we make in meditation. So I'm bringing it out that if you can imagine you are there, not that you are seeing yourself there, that you are there looking around, looking at the darkness around, your eyes are closed, therefore it's dark. And you can see on, on both sides. And that imaginative being that is seeing inside is not this body. You will notice that you can turn around inside with that self of yours without turning the head. You can look up, look down with that imaginative self inside and you are doing it. Who is that self that you can imagine is doing these things? To take a more gross example, if I were to say that you imagine you have come and are standing next to me here that you have left your chairs, just imagination, that you imagine you left your chair, you're standing here. Now you're standing here, you can, how many of you can imagine that, that you're standing here? You're all qualified for good meditation. That's what is required. If you can imagine you are standing here, how many of you can imagine you are standing here and looking back at the audience? Wonderful, you are more qualified now. Meditation is to imagine you are there and from there you are looking what is inside the head. It's, it's not that difficult. We should not make it into a ritual or make it into a very ceremonial thing. We should make it simple. The art of withdrawing attention behind the eyes is the art of imagining you are there. Now we have these wonderful gifts given to all of us. Some have it in deeper sense, some have a little lighter sense, but they all have these gifts, the gift of imagination, the gift of moving attention where you like, the gift of concentrating your attention where you like. Imagine these three gifts are all that are required for good meditation. The gift of imagination, the gift of attention, which is the only part of consciousness, the awareness that you move around. If you're sitting in this hall, the hall is where it is. You don't change anything, but you can decide to look this side or that side. You can decide to put your attention where you like. You cannot change awareness of this hall, but you can alter the direction of attention wherever you like. So this power of attention which can move your awareness and then third thing, concentration of attention. That you can concentrate your attention at any point you like. If you go to a concert, there are several musical instruments playing and you like the drums more than the others and concentrate on listening to the drums, you will notice that the other musical instruments will become less noisy, less sound and drums will become loud. Nothing has happened there. But your concentration is wiping out some of the awareness of other instruments. The same thing is true here. That when you concentrate your attention on anything, you are able to exclude the awareness of other things. These are the three miraculous things we have been given. And they are the ones that enable us to discover who we are. There is no religion involved in this. Is imagination religion? Is attention religion? Is power of concentrating attention religion? Not at all. These are human qualities. And these have been given to us so that we can seek our truth and find ourselves inside. So that is why if we can imagine we are inside and continue to put our attention on where we are inside the head and concentrate it there, you will slowly become unaware of what is around you. You will become slowly unaware even of the hands and feet of your own body. They start becoming numb 
and then they go into unawareness. You don't even know that you have them because you're concentrating there. You're looking what is there, not anywhere else. The more you concentrate on being there, the more you're becoming unaware of the extremities of your body, ultimately your torso, ultimately the whole body. And you float in a sky which opens up and you are not aware that you have a body. Such is the possibility of just using these three gate gifts that we have been given. And that is true meditation. It does not require any label. It does not require any title at all. It is not the privilege of any particular society. Not the privilege of any class. Not the privilege of any nation. It's open to all human beings. And we all are good candidates for meditation that gives us a knowledge of our own true self. Now, if we can do that, what is the real problem when we try to do that? Those who have tried it, they tell us the main problem is that the mind which thinks starts thinking while we are there, while we are imagining we are there, the mind starts thinking of things that are not there. The mind starts thinking of things that are outside of the body. The mind thinks of things to which we have been attached. The mind thinks of desires we have outside of the body. And therefore, it draws the attention out. Every time we think of something outside, we are drawn out. And therefore, we lose the awareness that we are inside behind the eyes. Only problem is the distraction of the mind by thinking of things to which we are attached and for which we have desires. These desires and attachments are holding us back. Nothing else. And there is nothing that we have to tackle in order to discover ourselves except our own mind and the distraction of the mind. Now we have to find some ways how we can avoid the mind from thinking of other things. Because when it thinks of something else, it takes the attention right there. We start thinking of our children, of our brothers, sisters, of parents, of employers, employees, jobs, and problems we had with people, the fight we had, the, the new car we were to buy, the broken things that we have to repair. Simple things, they draw our attention. We, we remember where we lost our keys. We couldn't find the keys, but in meditation you can find them. The mind wants to run to find things outside. These are the kind of things that take us out of our own self, out of the space where we want to concentrate our attention. How do you control these? That is now the practical side of meditation. The, the concept, the actual practice is very simple. One mystic, Bulle Shah, says, Rabda ki pana, etho putna, He says, it's not difficult to find God. Just pull your attention from here, put it there. He makes it one sentence. God realization is one sentence. And that's the truth. If you can do that, if you can put your whole attention there, you find God. But, when we are distracted by the mind, now we have to work out a system. Now that's where we come to the nitty-gritty part of meditation, that how do we prevent the mind from running out into our distractions? There are several steps we can use. One, we can start repeating words inside our head to squeeze out the words of thought. We can repeat the words inside our head so that we listen to the words we are artificially repeating and not let the mind think of other things. Mostly mind thinks in language, in words. So when we introduce some new words, of course those words should also not be distracting us. Supposing I say uh, my mind is now distracted, is thinking of my car and I got the repair of my car and so I have to pay a bill for that. Supposing my mind is thinking that. And I say, no, I am going to repeat the word ye old shaky speech, something I liked. And that's my mantra now. I say, shaky speech, shaky speech, it will take me into shaky speech. It's just a diversion from one external thing to another external thing. It won't help. Therefore, we must choose to repeat words that have no association with any of our things outside. But they should have association with what is happening inside. Supposing we can see some light inside. And I think of the light inside. I am then not distracting myself. If I think of a candle outside, I am distracting. If I think of a candle burning inside, I am pulling it in. If we can 
coined such words which have no meaning for us outside but have meaning inside, those words would be useful to squeeze the words of mind outside and prevent it from getting so distracted by putting thoughts outside. This is why they have invented the use of mantra, the use of simran, the use of repetition of words, holy words. Why are they holy words? Because we don't use them outside. We use the holy place where the soul rests. We use it in the temple, which is the real temple where we can find God inside our head. Since they come from there, they are holy words, they are charged words, they are empowered words. We can use any language, but the words are supposed to be those and we can't really coin them out because all our language is based upon association of ideas with outside things. But we can go to somebody who has better knowledge of what is happening inside, who can guide us and tell us that I can give you some words which don't have any meaning outside, but I can tell you they have an association of ideas, of things that happen inside. And we repeat those words, they don't mean anything to us, they don't distract us outside, but as we make progress in concentrating our attention, they begin to reveal to us why those words were there, because they relate to inner experiences which are generated when you become unaware of this body. So simple. That's how the mantras have been in, in, made up. They were made for this simple purpose, that you repeat them and repeat them not with the tongue. That's no use. Repeat with the thinking mind. You have to prevent the mind from thinking. Therefore, they must be repeated with the mind, with the same thought stream by which you think. You have to put those words into that thought stream so you know the thoughts can't come. It often happens that when we are repeating these words, and a lot of people are doing this mantra, they come and tell me, we've been repeating for years, nothing has happened. We repeat like a parrot. What good is this? That doesn't give us any self-realization no idea who we are. These are repeating like a parrot, sir, these words. If you repeat like a parrot, you'll get nothing. You'll become a parrot maybe next life. But if you repeat with the thoughts, the thought stream, the very language, the very sound with which the thoughts come, have you ever noticed how the thoughts speak? Do you recall? Well, uh, if you come to one of my meditations, uh, workshops, I'll tell you how to watch your mind and listen to it and you'll see the mind when it thinks has a voice. When you think of something, you are hearing words. Otherwise, you won't know you are thinking. Whenever you think, you are listening to words that your mind is speaking. It has a certain voice. It changes its voice also. It changes its voice when it thinks in two tones, in two channels. For example, you can be repeating certain words and the mind can be then commenting upon it. Are you repeating too fast? Is it you should slow down? You are repeating. Who is this voice? A second voice. And it is different. If you observe carefully, the second voice is finer, thinner and different from the first voice of thought. If you examine the way the mind thinks, it's a wonderful exercise to see in how many channels it can think. It can comment upon the thinking. thinking. It can be commentator upon the comment and so on. The, fine, the further you examine how many channels it has, the finer the sound becomes and becomes so subtle, ultimately you can't notice it. Some people can notice it at two levels, three levels, but some people can notice even more. I had the privilege of hosting His Holiness Dalai Lama in India when he first left Tibet and I, I was given the duty to receive him and host him in India and we used to travel together and discuss meditation. He was the one who said in his meditation, he could discover eight levels of mind thinking, one upon the other. And normally it's not possible. Normally people can go two, three, some can go to five. So, but if you examine the mind carefully in your head, you can find that the mind has several channels in which it thinks. So, you could be repeating like a parrot even with the mind. And a top voice of the mind is distracting you and thinking of something else. Good repetition of mantra. If you want to do that, if you want to successfully repeat words of Simran or Mantra, it should be done with every voice that you can hear in the head. Start with one. Notice if there's any commentator sitting. Allow the commentator to join in. 
They do the mantra in two voices. Three, four, whatever is required. Then the mind can play another trick during meditation. It can make a picture of a person that you like or you love. And that picture comes in front and you are again distracted. You are repeating words but your whole attention is on the person. Then if you want to use good repetition of a mantra, don't be distracted. Ask the guest who has arrived in your head to also join in the mantra. Supposing 10 people come, 10 join. When I advised, somebody told me that a large crowd came in the head and they all sang the mantra so loud. It was such a huge chorus that the entire attention was withdrawn and we left the body here and flew away into the sky. I am giving you these tips because we are many of us caught in ritualistic repetition of mantra, in ritualistic meditation, thinking it's a ritual and we just have to do it on a regular basis and that's all. And people just sit to say how many hours we have sat in meditation, which is highly unimportant. People don't realize it's not the hours at all. It's not the time factor, it's the quality of meditation that matters. Five minutes of concentration in the manner I'm telling you is worth more than three hours sitting and idly repeating the words and not having any concentration of attention on yourself taking place. I remember once I met a, a friend of mine from California. He came to India. He invited me to come and stay with him in California many years ago. I said, all right. I took a long journey from India to California arrived there tired. I thought I'll now sleep. And he said, very good. You are a good meditator. We'll meditate together. I thought I'll sleep for that night, especially with the jet lag. But I had to keep up my face. So I said, okay. We, I wouldn't say I'd ever meditate and I sleep. That I am like anybody else. So three o'clock, my alarm, we got up and we sat. He closed his eyes. I sat next to him. I was a little curious how, what the body looks like when one is in such, because my experience is that when you are really meditating by imagining things and seeing things, you have a certain smile on your face. And that smile is so involuntary. It comes by the realization. There is so much more inside. And you are smiling inside and there's also a smile on your face outside. I was opening the corner of my eye to see the smile on his face because he was meditating so seriously. Somehow, by coincidence, every time I opened my eyes to look at him, he was opening his eye and looking at his watch. <laughs> he was wearing his watch when he was meditating. I don't know whether he was looking all the time, but every time I opened my eyes from the corner and saw, he would open and look like this. Two and a half hours. We went through this torture of meditation. <laughs> and after that, he gets up and says, what a wonderful meditation we had, two and a half hours. We are quiet to do two and a half hours. And I said, my dear friend, we meditated for two and a half hours. But I want to mention that you meditated on your watch, <laughs> not on yourself. Because the entire time your attention is on the watch. And it's the strange thing is, that subjective time flows so differently. When we are sitting in a company and having good time, chatting away with friends, oh my God, three hours have passed. I didn't realize. And when we sit in meditation, must be two hours, ten minutes only. It looks like the subjective time changes so much because when you enjoy something, time flies. Also, I know I have sat with friends and we have sat on the floor and with a cross leg and chatted away, had coffee and snacks and enjoyed for two, three hours. And there was no pain in the knees. There was nothing hurting. Then we tried meditation after a few minutes. Oh, my knees are hurting now. Now I can't sit. My body is aching. How can there be such a big difference? The truth is the mind fights us. The truth is we have given so much power to our own mind. We have, our soul has empowered the mind to such an extent to give it a separate entity as if it is independent, as if it is running the show, as if it is ourself, as if we have sold ourselves to our mind. 
That's all right. That's what we made ourselves. Whereas the mind was given as a beautiful, wonderful thinking machine we could use to think whatever we like. Do you see the big difference? When a machine, a computer-like machine is given to you called the human mind and you can think whatever you like. Imagine what a great gift it is. And what are we doing with it? We are not using it. We allow the mind to randomly think what it likes and then we follow it blindly. We have made a servant, made a slave, our master. And that's why the mind takes advantage of it. Because the mind, by taking advantage, keeps our attention continuously on the desires and attachments it creates outside. And that's why when we become a slave of our own mind, it's very hard to pull our attention back. We are following the mind. Mind wants to follow the senses. Senses want to follow the world outside and not inside. We have to take control of the mind. Doing Simran or repetition of words or mantra is a means of taking control over the mind. It's trying to put thoughts that we like to put into the mind and not allow it to think of on its own. Make it a slave. And with practice, you can control the mind to the extent that it will think what you want it to think. Now, who is you when I say you want it to think? Very often we are confused because we confuse ourselves with the mind itself. When we say, I want to think this, who is that I? We, if we say the I is the mind, we can't get out of this trap. If we know the I is the cons cons conscious power that is making the mind think, that's making the senses work, that is making this body work, then we are separate from the mind. Then we can give an instruction. How can we distinguish between what is our mind and what is ourself? Not very difficult. Because the functions these two are performing, the function the soul and the mind are performing are totally different. The function of the mind is to think. Every time you think, it's the mind. Never confuse it. Now my soul is thinking. The soul never thinks. Every time you speak, the mind speaks. Every time you speak, whether with the tongue or with the mind, inside your head, the mind speaks. The mind is always the speaker. Soul never speaks. Soul listens. Soul listens to the mind. Soul is the consciousness that is picking up what the mind is speaking. Soul is the self that is experiencing everything. Soul is the experiencer. Mind is one of the actors, one of the instruments that we are using for creating experience. Therefore, when you listen, it's the soul in action. When you speak or think, it's the mind in action. But there are better ways to distinguish between the two. What takes time, like thinking, sensing, rationalizing, applying logic, trying to make sense of things, is all mind. What does not take time is soul. Now, what are the things that we are experiencing which does not take time? These three things I can immediately tell you. One, intuition. The intuitive knowledge never takes time. It comes suddenly. With no time. Intuition is not a function of the mind. And does not take time. Love is instantaneous. It is not created by thinking. It does not take time. The experience of appreciating beauty and joy. And having that bliss. Soul, not mind. So there are some functions the soul is performing at the same time. As the mind. The mind is thinking. Soul is getting intuitive gut feelings of things. We are continuously experiencing these things. So there is a big distinction. The functions of the mind are always in time and space and the functions of soul are beyond it. And they both work together because the soul, the empowering power, the unit of consciousness, has attached itself to the mind and covered itself with the mind like a garment. It's wearing the mind and is using it to think using it to communicate, using it to create, using it to build castles in the air and, and on the ground. All this is being done by the mind with the help of the power of the soul. Then the mind then covers itself with senses and divides perception into seeing, touching, tasting, smelling separately. Then all these get covered by a physical body with a short life and stay inside. And gradually physical body disintegrates becomes old, we shed it off. 
then we take another one. But why do we do that? The inner bodies remain intact. What are these inner bodies we talk of? This physical body is made of matter. And, could, and by wearing it, we have an experience of a material world, of a physical world. If we don't wear this, we don't see this physical body, physical world. We see it in a different way. We see the sense perceptions, the power to see, hear, touch, taste, smell, do not belong only to this physical body. They belong to the inner body. If you become totally unaware of this body, by putting your attention behind the eyes, and do not know you have a body, that imaginative body of yours has all the sense perceptions intact. You can fly where you like. It has no gravity, no weight. It has power to travel at high speeds. It's not bound like this body. You are using it and you call it imaginary things. It's, imagination is being derived from there, from the inner body. And we don't realize it. So therefore, the inner body has a longer life. It was there before we came into this body. It will be there after this body dies. Some people loosely call it the soul. Soul went from one body to another, reincarnated. Soul is not reincarnating. Soul never reincarnates. It's the astral body, the inner body, the sensory body that incarnates. And that is why that body has a longer life. In terms of physical years, the average life of a sensory system in a sensory body is 1,000 to 3,000 years of physical time. So during that time, you can have so many different bodies, different experiences. People say we have past life regression. In past life regression, they can remember what happened 200 years ago. They say must be a past life body. Not necessary. Because the inner body itself has that life and retains all the memory. And not only that. If you were to be unaware of the inner body also, and become only aware of your soul and the mind covering it. The mind itself is like a body. And we call it the causal body. It causes all experiences to happen in space and time. In the three worlds that we see around us. Causal, astral, physical. The world of concepts, the world of ideas and the world of matter. All these three worlds are being created from there. Therefore we say that's the cause. That's the universal mind from where we experience an individuated mind here. Just like from our own true source, from where we came as a soul. There is only one soul, one totality of consciousness. We experience division that we are so many. Similarly, the mind from the top of the third causal stage comes up and becomes individuated and becomes an individual mind attached to individual souls. That's the experience we are having now. These are, these are things that are all verifiable by anyone through simple process of good effective meditation. By going within, continuously going within. Go within this body to open up the next. Go within that body to open up the next. Go within that to open up your soul and find out who you are. The whole secret is going within. Because what we are doing is to go without, to go outside. All the time we are moving outside. These bodies were created to move more outside, more outside. And now we have to reverse it and go within. And that's the secret of finding who you are and eventually to find what your true home is. It's such a remarkable thing that the mind which we th think is only thinking, no, it's creating everything. It's creating all the experiences we are having at all levels, even now. But there's no, no way to prove it while you're sitting here. The reason why we cannot prove that the mind is creating all this is because this is our only reality. We have no comparison with any other reality. When we go to sleep at night and have a dream, the dream looks real. We move about, we have emotions, we cry, we laugh in the dreams, we have real contact with people. When we wake up, the dream becomes unreal. But while we are sleeping, we have, this body is unreal because we don't know where we are sleeping. We have no consciousness of the body. The dream is the only reality. We wake up, this is the only reality. If you go to a higher level of consciousness, that becomes the only reality. When we come back, this becomes the only reality. You have to remember, we did not go about this business of creating illusions. We went about the business of creating reality. These are levels of reality. People were calling them 
levels of consciousness, that these are different illusions. They are not illusions. Does this look illusion to you? If it was illusion, why would I be spending my waste and my time to an illusion? If you were all shadows, I would not be talking here. This is our reality. Our only reality. Not only is it real, it's the only reality we have nothing to compare with. So that is why this beautiful system of wearing a covers, becoming unaware of what is inside and taking the experience of the cover as our only reality makes these different levels of realities. And when we arise to these different realities, it does not mean that we always remember. For example, you go to sleep. Say, next time I am going to go to sleep, I am going to remember when I am awake also. You can't do it. In the dream, supposing you come to know in a dream that you are dreaming. It has happened. So many people say, we know it's a dream. I have I've had that experience and I have gone about telling people, you know, I know it's a dream. If I knew it's a dream, would I be telling those people who are not there even? Do you realize that in the dream, when you know it's a dream, you shout, oh, it's a dream. Who are you telling? When you wake up, you don't shout at all. You don't tell anybody. Because although you're speaking the truth, you're telling the truth in the dream, that's a dream. You're not aware of it. Same thing here. We are talking of higher levels of consciousness. We are telling the truth, but we are not aware of it. The only way to be really aware of it is to move into that reality by waking up. It is a series of wakefulness when we say that we can pull our attention behind the eyes and become unconscious of this body. It's a means of waking up to a different reality and discovering that reality. So that is why these are series of awakenings. They, are, they could be likened to awakenings. And more so because when you awaken, you find that you, were, you never left. When we go to sleep in our bed, and have a dream, we go far off different places. When we wake up, we are still in the same bed. We never left. We had experience. We were very far away. When you awaken to your own reality, from this dream we call the wakeful state, you discover we never left. All these experiences of going around here, they are part of a dream or dream-like experience. But the nature of laws of this particular experience are different. Laws of this experience are different at every level. In a dream, when you go to sleep in a dream, you can instantly go from one place to another and it looks normal. You are now, in one moment, you are here in Chicago, next moment you are in London, third moment you are in Tokyo. Ah, normal. Nobody ever questioned, how did it come so quickly? Nobody has ever said that. Secondly, things move so fast in the dream, you can be at one moment at this time and 10 hours later, without any passage of time, you are there next morning, you are there next night. You move time so swiftly, you can't do it here. And it looks absolutely normal in a dream. It looks real. And here it will look absurd. If that happened, we would be screaming, freak out. How is it happening? We never freak out in a dream. The rules that govern we fall in a dream from a house, we never get hurt. And here, you fall from here, we get hurt. So the rules that govern our experience in a dream state are so different from the rules that govern, we call them laws of nature. The laws of nature of a dream state are different than the laws of nature of the physical state. Similarly, the laws of nature of the sensory system, when you rise to an extra reality, are totally different from the laws of this physical reality. I can give you some examples which you will encounter when you go there. We have an experience what we call telepathy here, telepathic communication, that one person can think and the person can understand. Some people have that experience. Actually, we all have that experience, but we don't use it because we don't believe it, believe in it. There's so much depending on belief that we don't believe it's possible. Unless I talk to you, how can you understand what I'm thinking? That this is all secret. My thoughts are all secret. Nobody can see them. In the next uh, higher state of awareness, that's the astral stage, there are no secrets. You can read everybody's mind. So it's a different life altogether. Imagine what a big difference that itself creates. Secondly, 
telepathy does not require spoken or written language. Here, we cannot communicate except by spoken or written language. In telepathy, you can speak in German, think in German. Somebody who doesn't know German can understand you. Because telepathy does not convey the language. Telepathy conveys the meaning of what you are trying to say. You understood it in one language which you associated with those ideas. Another person is using another language, but the meaning is still the same. Now here we can't transfer meanings without using language, so we get bound out. But at the astral plane, you can think in any language, another person can understand the meaning. Very big difference. Incidentally, people who do telepathic communication even here know that language is not used in telepathic communication. Only the meaning is conveyed even here. They never get the words of what is being spoken. They get the meaning of what the words are. Telepathy is the same thing. It's just a little infrequent experience here. There is a regular experience there. Very big difference. Another big difference, there is no gravity in that astral plane. Nobody is taking weight control pills or something. Nobody is doing exercise for keeping the body trim. Everybody has their wonderful time and they can fly, they can go about, they do telepathic things. Knowledge is picked up by a volume of knowledge instead of volume of books. Lot of, lot of differences are there. And then you recall the memory becomes so sharp, you can recall what happened 100 years ago, you can recall previous lifetimes. You also recall that the name you have given to your body, physical body, before you would draw your attention there, is not your name. Is the name of the body and you had several names of different bodies in the past. These are all experiences that are available to us when we are human beings and we meditate properly by going within. It is just a matter of practice that we can do all this. It's not a fairy tale I am trying to tell you to make it look beautiful. I am saying this is all possible. Check it out. Try it at least. We all have the capability to do it. We call ourselves seekers of truth. Let's seek properly where it belongs. Let's seek where it is. It's all within. It's all inside. It's not outside. So by rising to that level, we go to the level of our mind, we discover the completely different laws operating. At the causal plane where only mind exists and no sense perceptions, we find perception is only one activity. We divided it deliberately at the astral and physical planes to have a wider spectrum of experience. The hearing, touching, tasting, smelling are all the same thing when you want to perceive something. You can't understand it here, but you do understand it at the causal plane. That's how you perceive. A very big difference in the experience there. Secondly, you discover a very important fact that what we know about time here is totally different from what time actually is. Here we think that time flows, time is flowing, and we are going along with it today, today, then, then tomorrow will come. Then, Actually, there you find time never flows. Time is static. Time is built at one time, at one go, the entire time was created, all events were placed upon it, and we are going from one point of event to the other. We are time traveling, time is not moving. We used to say, Egyptians learned how to time travel. I said, why we are learning it now? We don't have to learn. We are doing it right now. Are we not moving on time? Are we not moving from one event to another? Yes, time travel. Time does not move at all. In fact, we discover in the causal plane that time actually does not exist. It's created by a very little device called memory. The real time never exists, even now, here. And when I explain that, people think it's something extraordinary to be able to say that time doesn't even exist when we are all experiencing it right here. I give them a simple method of testing it out. What is present when you say, I am talking to you in the present? If present is now, and people tell me you should live in the now, big philosophers are advising, you should live in the now, the power of now. And I wonder if anybody is living in any other place than now. We are all living in now all the time. There is there no way to get out of it. Has anybody ever lived in any time other than now? What are we telling people? Live in the now? They are living in the now. You can't live 
in the past or the future. You can only live in the now. And surprising thing is that now has no time at all in which we are living. Not even a billionth part of a nanosecond. The moment its nanosecond passes, it's past. Before it, that, it was future. Now is a meeting point between past and future and does not exist as, as time. How are we experiencing it? If it doesn't even exist, if time is not even existing in now, how are we experiencing it? We are calling that which is immediate past as present. We are calling that as now. I speak a word, I just spoke a now. No, it was in the past. Nobody can speak in the now. Nobody can do anything in the now. Nobody can think in the now. Nobody can live in the now. We are living in the past. Consider carefully that if you want to examine the nature of time, you understand that time, if it is now, and now has no time, and we all live in the now, we are not living in time. What are we living in? What is giving us the feeling of time? We are living in the past. Instant, immediate past, which we call present. Old past, which we call past. Therefore, past is the only reality. What about future? Maybe there is something called future, where all the events are going to come up upon us, and tomorrows will come, and day after tomorrow will come. That must be existing. Of course not. If we could delete three words from the dictionaries of this world, hope, fear, anticipation. Actually, all these three are the same thing. Hope is positive anticipation, fear is negative anticipation, anticipation neutral. If we can eliminate that, we eliminate future. Did you ever notice that if you don't have these, there is no future at all? Future ceases to exist. Unless we hope and fear that this might happen, this will happen. It's our, it's our experience. In the now, which has no time. Then, to hope takes time, which means it's in the past. To fear takes time, it's in the past. To anticipate takes time, it's in the past. Everything is in the past. What we call past, present and future is all past. And nobody can live in the past except through memory. Therefore, once you install a memory capsule into consciousness at the causal stage, all time becomes real for us. All events become real and time begins to flow. Actually, there is no time at all, even here or in the astral plane or anywhere. But we are experiencing it. The way it's created is so remarkable. But you see how wonderful consciousness can create the experience of time when there is actually no time through memory. Now it makes very easy to explain what is our destiny. Destiny is merely a memory capsule which we picked up. We picked up like a DVD, encapsulated DVD at the causal plane. We pick up, play it, it becomes our life. It becomes our causal life, our astral life and our physical life. We can pick up one, one little DVD for one life, come here for one life, let me go just for a trip into this physical material world and then I go back. We pick up one capsule, come for one life and we discover that one life is dependent upon a past life. Because that's the law of nature here. In the physical plane, in the astral plane, the causal plane, the law, like other laws I just explained to you, is cause and effect. That's how it's created through the experience of time. Cause and effect. Law of karma. That's a great law. People talk of it all the time. Law of karma. It's all by karma. What is karma? Karma is the experience embedded in that capsule we pick up at the causal stage. And then we play it out. In order for any event to take place in the DVD, there must be a prior event, a prior cause. Probably in another life. Because this life can't start without some prior lives. Now, we have never lived a prior life. We just want to come first time, soul on an adventure into the land of time and space. And the soul comes and takes one life and is tagged on to that one life is a previous life. And previous life cannot exist without another previous life. That cannot exist without another 
infinite number of previous lives are immediately added on to us. It's a memory capsule. They become our life. We remember them. We remember as if we lived them. We are responsible for them. Karma becomes a real activity. Karma becomes a real reality for us. It's not real at all. Even lives are not real. Even past lives are not real. But we have to create the past lives to create a present life. And therefore, once we pick up that destiny from that causal plane and we bring it here, it creates past lives and the current life that creates the future lives. And therefore, we get trapped. Once we are here and we do not go back to realize that we came for adventure. We do not say adventure over, let's go home. We don't say that. We continuously move in this trap of life after life. All the time I'm telling you, check it out, verify that's how it's working. And can be done at the second stage, causal stage of awareness, which can be achieved by becoming unaware of the physical body and unaware of your astral sensory body. And you come to know all these things. So it's amazing how this whole creation has been changed from consciousness. That consciousness can pick up and create memory. And memory is merely a creative creation. In no time you create a capsule of memory and that expands to create past, present and future in which you are living. If you go above that, supposing you are able to go beyond the mind, that means you will leave that causal system behind and discover your soul and separate it, which can be done. If you separate yourself, all karma, all this duality, everything is left behind. You don't carry anything. The soul never had karma, never will. Soul is beyond karma. Only the mind can have karma. The mind carries all karma. When we identify ourselves with the mind, we become subject to the laws of karma. When we identify ourselves with the sense perceptions, sense perceptions become our reality. When we identify ourselves with this physical body, physical body becomes ourself. That's how it's happened. We can reverse the whole process and become unaware of these, pull our awareness out of these and discover the truth. It's a matter of practice. I can keep on talking to you for days on these subjects, but the thing is, practice, go within and check it out. Say, this guy said something, I want to check it out for myself. I don't want to believe anything blindly. And I recommend very strongly that the true spiritual path does not allow any blind faith at all. It's totally experiential. And you should only believe what you experience. And the leap of faith, if required, should be only for one step forward. And say, let me test that. Since this has happened, let me see the next can happen. If next doesn't happen, hold on. If the next happens, then be willing to take one more step on leap of faith, no more. Don't sit at home and say, I found out the whole pathway to God and I found my true home and now I just have to sit and wait. That's blind faith. Living faith. Faith that grows like living things. Every day new experience happens and your faith grows. Small miracles happen. As you know, they were not happening before. What has happened now? Small coincidences happen. They build living faith. Whereas just to believe somebody has gone to a temple or a church or a synagogue, somebody said something, you believe it. That's blind faith. Make it a living faith. That means every day an experience will be added on and make it living. We'll take a little break now. Thank you very much. <laughs>